everybody, Lord Tremendous here. Got another book review here for you. This one is an audiobook. Well, I listened to it in the audiobook, and I've been listening to it for a while now. It's called Unexpected Destiny by Trevor Ames Gregg. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he's... No, he's not the narrator. The narrator is Ryan Kennard Burke. Remember that name. The dude is amazing. Uh, the audiobook was released May 17th of this year, 2019. It's about six hours and 46 minutes. This is a uh, fantasy sci fi. Well, it's a fan. Uh, sci bleh. It's a sci fi book. I apologize. Words are difficult for me today. And it's like a space opera. And it is a magnificent space opera. I. Got it with an audiobook credit, but you can get it for $13.97. It's available in paperback for $9.99, and of course it's on Kindle Unlimited, but it looks like you can buy it for about a dollar. So this is a great, great value for the story that you get. I cannot stress that enough. So basically, this book is Star Trek meets Star Wars with a sprinkling of space balls, and... Just a little bit of kink. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it is outstanding. I loved everything about this book. Uh, the main character is a guy. Uh, he's... It kind of does like a real steel thing. The dude starts off as kind of a moron. He makes a deal with some seedy people. And then, of course, he goes up against it. Or he changes his mind at the last minute. And I'll get into that in the spoilers. But uh, needless to say, that does not work out for him. He runs away, uh, gets gets off the world, and then, of course, gets uh, some horrible things happen to him until he runs into uh, the girl in the picture there with the cat ears, Alice. She's an engineer-type person. See that wrench that she's got? That thing changes into all sorts of stuff. It's like a, a, a catch-all. It's pretty cool, actually. I like the technology or the idea of the technology, even though it's a little crazy, but it, it, it works. It really does. It, it, it doesn't... This book is so much fun. I really don't want to spoil a whole lot for you, especially in the non-spoiler section. That'd be kind of a jerk thing to do. But it's this roller coaster ride of them just jumping from one situation to another and getting the crap beaten out of them in the process. They, the main character, Keenan, he, he gets his, his butt kicked all the time. He starts off as an idiot and he does a lot of idiot things and it gets him just throttled. It gets him into some really terrible situations. But it's great because he learns from it. You know, he he doesn't just start off with all this knowledge. He's got a skill set, don't get me wrong. But he learns from his mistakes as he goes on until at the very end of the book, he's he's kind of coming to his own. He kind of knows who he is and he kind of realizes, oh, I, I got to get smarter. <laughs> and he's like, it's great. It really is. It's funny. It's well written. It's a good story. It's a series. This is a series. I think uh, there's two more books after this one, and I believe they're already out. So it's really, really worth getting into. I'm definitely getting the other audiobooks of this. I don't care. I'm enjoying it that much. But yeah, they, they, they have to... Basically, there's a big bad. Think of it as basically a cybernetic Vader who's running around destroying everything uh, because, well, he's a homicidal madman that's taken over by a super AI computer. Yeah, yeah. And that's who they got to face off against. They run into uh, some allies along the way. They run into a little kid looking person that is an oracle that kind of, you know, it's she knows their destiny and they run into a tentacle dude uh, who uh, bore me or something like that. <laughs> and it's great too because his regeneration abilities are off the chart. He gets chunks of him ripped off all the time. It's great. <laughs> So anyway, when they meet up with Alara, they gotta, she sets them off on this epic Destiny Quest thing. She goes with them to try to find what they need in order to take out the big bad guy, the, the Thanos-level character or whatever, which is hilarious. Uh, and he's, he's a badass. He's blowing up like whole battle groups all by himself with his little Dragoon uh, army fleet thing. And it's it's a lot of fun. And the great thing about it is they the heroes are constantly on the back foot. There's no convenience for... Well, okay, that's not entirely true. But there there's so little convenience for the sake of convenience that all the inconvenience easily overshadows it. So you can forgive it, which is, in my opinion, exactly what you're going for. 
And this narrator, I, oh, amazing. Probably one of the best narrators I've ever listened to in my history of listening to audiobooks, which spans a few years now. Seriously, if you have the opportunity, check this book out. It's five out of five. I got to give it five out of five. There's just no other way to do it. I loved everything about this book, and I can't wait to see what happens in part two. I'm downloading it as we speak. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, just everything about this book is fun. The whole Star Trek meets Star Wars with a dash of space ball, like, fun. It... It, it doesn't take itself too serious, but at the same time, it is a seri- it, it, it is, you know, like a, a I don't want to say a serious story because it's kind of a tongue in cheek thing, but it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to listen to it. It's a lot of fun to listen to the narrator. And, and it's just a real solid story. This is what you're looking for when you're looking for a, a space opera, plain, simple and to the point. So, yeah, yeah, five out of five. I'm going to go ahead and play the ad real quick, and then uh, I'll get into the spoilers, so get ready. All right, in case you guys didn't already know, I am a self-published author, which is why I'm so passionate about self-published books. Uh, It's available on Amazon.com and Paperback, Kindle, and Kindle Unlimited. If you're interested, the link's in the description. I'd really appreciate it checked out, left a review. So get ready, spoilers are coming up next, so if you're still here and the music stops, it's your fault. All right, you're still here, so let's get at it. So it starts off, and this guy, Kieran, he's the main character. He is a uh, steel robot guy, a real steel type of thing, where he fights these robots that him and his little brother make in order to win money and prize and prestige. Well, he's on his way with his little brother to this fight where they're going to fight their robot in their first, like, league match, their, their title match or whatever. And Kieran wants to earn enough credits for him and his brother to get off-world and join a starship crew and basically travel the stars working that way. Which is great and all, but he has to throw the match in order to do it. He took a bribe from a local uh, gang, thug, whatever, and and so he's got to throw this match. Well, his little brother idolizes him, and he's like, you know, we're going to do it. I can't believe we worked so hard to get to this point, yada, yada, yada. So you already can tell that this ain't happening. Like, it, the, the foreshadowing is so obvious. It, there's There might as well be a flare going off every couple of paragraphs, but they get into the fight. They could easily win the fight. He starts throwing the match, and this is where you find out that the main that the that the male main character is kind of an idiot. He looks at his little brother, and although throwing the match will crush his little brother, will really disappoint him, really hurt his heart, they would be off planet, they would be off world, they'd be gone. But he can't do it. He can't give his brother a better life and, and disappoint him at the same time. It's a whole have your cake and eat it too thing. So what he ends up doing is winning the fight. And needless to say, uh, he owed them, they were going to pay him 50,000 50, credits, right? And they're pissed, understandably pissed. He betrayed a gang member, a, a gang member with some influence. And so they approach him right as the fight ends, and the bad guy is like, you were supposed to throw that. And he's like, yeah, I know, but vis-a-vis, it's over now. Let's just let bygones be bygones. And the gang member's even like, what? Bygones be bygones? You're a dead man. And he pulls a gun. <laughs> he, he goes to shoot him, and his little brother gets in the way and takes it and dies right then and there. Kieran, uh, he runs off. He, he, he escapes. He goes running away. The guys chase him for a little bit. And he's, he, he runs away. He gets away. He's in a park. And he breaks down crying because he got his little brother killed. Because, well, he's an idiot. And uh, then he goes to a, a, a contact. After he gets himself back together, he goes to a contact, a friend or whatever, and says, I need 15000 right now to get off the planet. People are after me. And his buddy's like, there's only one job I can think of for something like that, which really kind of bothers me, actually, because, again, the whole, it's very rare that convenience for the sake of convenience happens in this book. But in this situation, it does. All of a sudden, he could have found a job instantly to do that would get him off the planet. So why not do the job? improve your life and your little brother's life for a little bit and then do a bigger job to to knock all this stuff out because you find out later he's only got three credits to his name 
So getting to that, he accepts this job and it requires him to go into a bad part of the city, which is like not law enforced at all and deliver this pro or pick up this product to deliver to the guy who's going to pay him 15 K. He goes, he, he gets jumped, he gets mugged. He loses all of his stuff. He loses the three credits he has to his name. Uh, but he, you know, whatever, just kind of one of those things that shows that there's a whole bunch of different aliens in this uh, universe and not all of them like humans. So he returns with the stuff after like a real simple uh, kind of a, a, a humorous way to get past customs. The thermos that he has is basically full of raw poop and the, the human opens it up and gets a nose full of, of just raw, you know, poop. And he's like, oh, what is that? And he's like, my girlfriend makes it for me. I think it's delicious. And the guy's like, you're fucking gross. <laughs> and just hands in the thermos with the contraband inside of it and they go ahead and go. So he returns, you know, he, he delivers the item he was supposed to deliver. He makes his 15 grand. He gets off, uh, off world just barely, just barely. The goons are waiting for him because the guy that he, he did the job for turned him over to the other goons that were trying to kill him. They go ahead and uh, they, they shoot at him a little bit, but they actually miss him. But it's not one of those stormtrooper aim things. The guy gets lucky as hell. So that all works out. After uh, he gets off world, he's uh, he's he meets up with this captain and uh, she hires him on. It takes a little bit, but he, she hires him on and she's like, you know, scumbag, you'll be ready at this time at this location or we'll leave without you. And he's like, he's all excited. He's all happy. Gets to his room. And one of the thugs that works for the goon that was uh, that he owes money to that he double crossed knocks him out. When he wakes up, he's on a slave ship. <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh wow, okay, so things are not going well for this guy. Which, don't get me wrong, he did it to himself. So, he goes ahead and uh, he's a uh, he's basically forced labor. His debt was sold to this slave captain to uh, 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 basically work off doing salvage runs in the middle of space. They are not nice to him. He gets beat up all the time. But over the months that he spends doing this stuff, uh, not only does he get better at operating like exosuits and, and space crawls and stuff like that. So again, he's earning his skill set, which I really, really appreciate. Uh, this, this author, Trevor uh, Gregg, really knocked it out of the park with that. And so he, he's, over the months, he's building up this skill set for, for surviving in space and doing odd jobs in space. And he meets the other main character, Alice, which is the cat girl on the cover. She's an engineer, also a slave. Uh, she got sold into this thing by her former boss who doubled-crossed her because a job went south. Although she says it wasn't her fault, he says it was. You can figure out. Listen to the book, you pick a side. I don't care. Uh, needless to say, they become friends. He flirts with her, and she's like, well, why not? And uh, they, nothing really ever happens romantically between them, but it is like the tentative, uh, like flirtatious love story between the two of them. So what ends up happening is they're out on uh, a spacewalk together salvaging when the ship that they're basically uh, uh, detained on comes under attack by a group of pirates who basically destroy their ship. They're able to get through the whole fight, which is actually a pretty cool scene. They're, they're spacewalking through a laser battle in space. It's very cool. They get back on the, on the ship, their ship, that's getting ripped apart. They get into a, they get into a, where, uh, a place where they can uh, get into an escape pod. The Alice, she does something really smart. She fires all the escape pods. I know it's kind of damning the rest of the crew, but they're mostly dead at this point anyway. So they, they get off the ship by sh firing off all the space pods. The bad guys do fire at the space pods, but they can't get a hold of all of them. They land on this planet, and on this planet is this oracle, Alara. She looks like a little kid, but she's actually like 250 years old. And she explains to them, you know, I knew you were coming. Come with me. You have a destiny. You're going to save the universe. They're starving and hungry and, you know, stranded on this, on this rock. So they follow her, and she shows a journal. Basically, it looks like a little kid's coloring book where she's drawn pictures of them in the space battle, uh, of Kieran holding his brother, his, his brother's corpse, of Alice and her betrayal onto the ship, stuff like that, which kind of makes them believe her a little bit. So another ship shows up, picks them up off the planet, which the Oracle knew was going to happen, 
And of course, they get attacked by the big bad guy. They think Darth Vader uh, in New Hope when he shows up and captures Leia right off the bat. That's what happens here for the most part, only they don't capture them. The, uh, the big bad guy is tearing through the ship, killing everybody, and they escape in a little shuttlecraft. Uh, they get they jump out of there and and basically leave the rest of them to their doom. Which I mean, you know, it, it's it's not super heroic, but they're not heroes yet. So the three of them are uh, going across the galaxy, trying to figure out how they're going to fight back, where they're going to go, what the big bad guy is, and basically he's this four. He's it's it's this like huge four armed lunatic cyborg that found a supercomputer. It's called the Epsilon computer. And he attaches it to the back of his head. He doesn't know why he does it. He picks this thing up and he thinks, wow, I've hit it big time. I'm going to be able to sell this thing for a trillion credits. And then he's compelled to put it on the back of his head. And once he does, it like cyborgs him up even more. He puts a whole bunch of tendrils in him. And it's, it's pretty badass. So he becomes the grievous we all deserved. So that being said, he goes... Uh, they, they face off on against him, and you discover real quick once they face off that the Epsilon computer can't, can't predict the, guy, the bad guy's future when they're around. They're the variables. Basically, they're Neos. And so it kind of throws off this Epsilon computer's trajectory because it predicts his future super accurately based on all the variables that it currently has at its disposal. So that's how the bad guy is able to... I don't know, have like an advantage on all the other good guys and he's always able to destroy everything because he knows where to be, when to be, how to attack and all that other good stuff. And that happens a lot. The The big bad guy shows up all over the place and uh, is it really thwarts him a lot. They run into the tentacle guy, Boromir. That's not his name, like Boris or Boronis or something like that. And he's like this weird Cthulhu looking dude with tentacles. He's the resident genius and... What's cool about him is like he can be ripped apart a lot and he and, and it just grows back. He bleeds black, which is pretty cool. But he's also super strong for like the 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 scientist of the group, you know, who you would normally think is a C3PO, but no, really he's Chewbacca with a brain. And uh I know Chewbacca's not stupid, but you get my point. So anyway, they uh they go and they find this artifact which turns out to be a ship. Needless to say, uh, when they, they have to fight off a, a mercenary to get, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to get this ship, but when they get it, it's like this, I don't know if the ship is intuitive, or if it's living, or a combination, or if it's got some sort of Epsilon I, uh, AI in it or something, but it kind of adapts to their needs the longer they drive it. Like, some systems will go down, because if they were to activate them then, bad things would happen, and they don't know that, so they're trying to activate the system. They can't get it to work. They think they're dead. And all of a sudden, the system works. And then they, they use it, and they get away or whatever. And then they realize, wow, if that system had been online when we tried to use it, we would have died. That's crazy. And that keeps happening. Like, they lose an engine at one point during a fight. And they're trying to jump, and they can't jump. They can't jump. And then all of a sudden, the other engine comes back to life, and they're able to jump. And then as soon as they get where they're supposed to go, the engine shuts back down. And they're like, well, why did that happen? That's nothing we did. What's going on? So they're really starting to make you believe that the Millennium Falcon might be, I don't know, alive? Johnny Five-ish? I'm not sure. Maybe it has something to do with the Epsilon computer technology that the big bad guy has. I'm not sure. It doesn't tell you. This is also book one of, I think, three. So anyway, they go ahead and uh, they they find uh, another relic that will help them fight off the big bad guy, which is some sort of weird, like, Epsilon-destroying bomb. And in the in the final scene, Alice, the cat uh, engineer lady, is trying to arm this bomb that she's able to interact with because it's all mental, and that's, like, her destiny is to, be, is to manipulate this bomb in order to stop this big bad guy. Uh, Kieran is now in a battle suit, like this big exosuit that he's got all that practice in because he was a slave for so long and he can now go toe to toe with him. Although that being said, he gets his ass kicked badly. It's not until a little bit later when he's about to get killed that the Boromir tentacle guy shows up and starts fighting the big bad guy. Well, the big bad guy quite literally rips him in half the long way. It's pretty cool. It and uh, they're not. It, it kind of leads you to believe he could regenerate from that, but he he might not. They don't really know. It's not looking good, which would suck. I really like that character. I like all the characters, but that one was he was he was really cool in my opinion. And then uh, 
they the the Kieran guy, of course, he's all pissed off because his buddy just got ripped in half, understandably, and he puts a hurting on the bad guy. And just when you think, okay, he's gonna kill the bad guy, he actually doesn't. Uh, the bad guy throws him over a, a like one of those bottomless pits that's always in the big spaceship battles and stuff, and uh, starts to go after Alice, who's just about ready to set off the bomb, but not quite. Well, the Oracle gets in the way. And uh, although she predicted this, and she even showed him the picture in her little coloring book about the the big bad guy was going to kill her, they all were kind of like, no, no, we'll, we'll stop it. Because they like this girl at this point, you know? She's their friend. She's their ally. Well, it actually happens. Like, the author doesn't pull any punches. The guy straight grabs her by the neck and snaps it. I <laughs> mean, just... Like, it literally says, the lights go out in her eyes. She's dead, dead. I thought that was, I mean, that was, I thought they were going to stop it. I thought they were going to break her her prediction or whatever. So I was impressed with the author to have the balls to do something like that. Not every author does, which just improved the story for me. Needless to say, though, Kieran is able to grab the wall of this cavern as he's fallen, and, and thanks to the exosuit, climb back up. He grabs an electrical wire that's hanging up from their fight. One of them got knocked down in this weird uh, uh, vault that they're fighting in. And uh, he zaps the crap out of the big bad guy with uh, a bunch of electricity. And then, you know, they think he's dead. So he's talking to Alice like, you know, finish the bomb, finish the computer. And she's like, my hero. And then the big bad guy gets up and wails on Kieran, dazing him. Doesn't kill him, but dazes him pretty good. So uh, they have one more big fight where basically Kieran's able to shove a, shove a sword through his head that comes out of the exosuit. He's able to just, yeah, from the chin to the skull. And uh, they think he's dead, but just to make sure they detonate the bomb, which is supposed to neutralize him. But there's a part two, so we'll see. Uh, there's also a part three, so I'm willing to bet he comes back. But all in all, I really enjoyed this book. It, it was a pleasure to listen to. It was a pleasure to, to, to pay attention to. The narrator, I know I've already said it, the narrator is flawless. The voices that he does, the, the enthusiasm, the correct inflections, he makes the book better. Simple as that. Uh, I, I can't recommend it enough. This book was amazing. If you're into audiobooks and science fiction and space operas, and if you haven't re- listened to this book yet, you are wrong. Five out of five stars. Can't recommend it enough. I'm going to go listen to book two. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this one, guys and gals. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or complaints, feel free to put them in the comments section below. And as always, thanks.